right, now it's time to... This is on. Hi, everybody. Welcome to WTF Cinema. Um, gosh. Um, you know what I like? I like it when Hollywood tries something different. I, I think we're all kind of tired of endless reboots and mindless sequels, right? We want new stories. I, I like it when they, for example, adapt something that hasn't been on TV or movies before. Or even when they try something experimental, even though most of the times it ends up pretty miserable. But I think one thing we can all get behind is a bad idea is trying to adapt a song into a movie. Songs can be great. Songs can tell great stories. Uh, Devil Went Down to Georgia, just to pick one for example. It's got a beginning, middle, and end. It's a decent story, right? It tells an entire story in a three-minute period. There are countless others. Music's not really my thing, uh, but I'm sure all of you can think in your heads of a song that tells a good story. The problem is trying to take that three-minute story and stretch it out into 90 minutes. I've seen it attempted twice. The first time was with Alice's Restaurant, which is a 17-minute song that was stretched into almost two hours, and it wasn't good. <laughs> uh, it loses almost all of the charm of the song and then hits the anti-war message a little too hard, but the other time I've seen it happen was Convoy. So let's see how a four-minute song turns into a 112-minute movie. Spoiler alert, the answer is badly. Arizona, noon on the 7th of June when they hive all over the pass. Oh good, if at any point in the next two hours I lose track of the plot, I know the soundtrack will be there to catch me up. Our film opens with our main character, the rubber duck, flirting with some girl as he's driving his big rig. Now I know typically, I like to play around with main characters' names. I come up with something cute and stick with it. Or I name him based off a character he played in another movie. Or I'll just use the actor's name. But I like the idea of our big, strong, virile man being called Rubber Duck. So I'm going to stick with the movie on this one. Their shenanigans nearly cause an accident. And I want you to pay close attention to this accident. See, the girl has pulled alongside the big rig and is taking pictures of the guy driving it. This means she's driving into oncoming traffic and not paying attention to the road in front of her so she can't see the cop coming at her because she's taking pictures up over here, right? Now the cop, despite being in a desert with great visibility on a nice clear sunny day, also doesn't see her in the wrong lane until almost the last second. When seeing somebody, he's in this lane, right? The other lane's over here. Do we, do we, do we have this now? When seeing somebody in front of him, Instead of veering off to the road right here, he cuts in front of the 18-wheel truck, cuts in front of that, and goes off the road over here, making it infinitely more dangerous. Then, spins around and goes after them. Now, from his point of view, the woman was clearly in the wrong, right? The truck driver was just driving a truck in the correct lane, trucking along. And then this woman was hanging out on the wrong side of the road, taking pictures. I wonder who he's going to pull over. Yeah, that seems about right. He's charged with going 11 miles over the limit and reckless driving. How? You saw him for exactly three seconds before you veered in front of him and then went off the road. From what you saw, he was in his lane driving forward. There's nothing reckless about that. He was driving. This other chick's doing wacky stuff next to him. He's just driving. Also, you were coming from the other direction and didn't see him for very long. How can you know how fast he was going, stupid donut jockey? Full disclosure, I'm actually pro-police. I donate regularly to a charity for fallen police and fire. One of my closest friends is married to a cop. I fully support cops. I've never had any issues with them. But these aren't real cops in this movie. So if this movie is going to portray all cops as stereotypical Nazi goose steppers, then I'm going to go ahead and insult the, the fictional make-believe parody cops in this movie with impunity. She doesn't have any pants on. Look at her. 
No panties or anything? Nothing. Okay. I'm gonna let you off with a stern warning. Rubber Duck shows that he's got cunning and gets out of his ticket by appealing to the base sexism that exists in all men. While driving along, Rubber Duck talks to a couple of other truckers and we learn that Rubber Duck is something of a local legend. Even Pigpen and Spider Mike here have heard of him. Sheriff Buford T. Justice here is using his CB to trick all three truck drivers into thinking it's safe to go ahead and lay the hammer down until they come across his parked car and then they all pull over. He denies owning a CB, even though it was him on the CB just then, very clearly, because that would be entrapment. So, luckily, he's willing to let them all off for $40 a piece, no ticket. Oh, good, we've got our crooked cop, an essential for any truckin' movie. The trio of truckers pulls off to eat, but before Rubber Duck goes off to shack up with his favorite waitress, he runs into the girl from before. See, she got away from the cop by agreeing to have sex with him in a motel down the road, where presumably he's still waiting for her. Then she pulled into this diner, sold her car, and is now trying to hitch a ride. Rather than get a speeding ticket, she chose to sell her car at a truck stop. And by the way, if the guy was waiting for you to have sex with him at the motel, presumably you could keep on going, and by the time he realized you weren't coming up, you'd be gone instead of selling your car. But how else are she and Rubber Duck going to hook up? When Buford T shows up in the parking lot, two of the truckers start making fun of him using the restaurant's CB, knowing that he'll never be able to figure out that they're the ones making fun of him. Now here's where the sheriff shows what a truly nasty character he really is. Knowing from previous dialogue that the 40 bucks he took off of Spider Mike, our black trucker, was Spider Mike's last dollar, he is now asking all the truckers to show how much money they have, and when Spider Mike announces he has no money, the sheriff decides to arrest him for vagrancy. This movie just went from fun to mean really quick. Rubber Duck tries to reason with the sheriff by telling him that Mike is about to be a father. His wife is about to give birth to a baby, to which the sheriff responds, Does anybody know who the father is? Anybody know who the father is? Things go south pretty quickly after that. You a five-minute bar fight ensues, and after beating up the sheriff at his backup, our truckers with the girl in tow, make for the state line as quick as they can. They're joined by a lot of other patrons from the diner who did join in the fight, so they've got themselves a convoy, and we've got ourselves a title. It also means saying goodbye to this character, Rubber Duck's waitress. I'm kind of glad to see her go, though, because she always looks like she's just on the verge of tears, even when she's about to have sex with Rubber Duck for his birthday. Seriously, sister? That's your aroused face? Even in a commandeered hot rod, the sheriff has a hard time catching up to our convoy. Of course, it's an accident that he has no problem walking away from. This is another one of those truck and movie tropes. While our convoy of 18-wheelers navigate a tiny dirt road that, for some reason, the cop cars can't handle, but the 18-wheelers can, I'd like to ask the movie this question. Why do you have a convoy? I mean, it kind of, I guess, makes sense in the heat of the moment for the three main truckers to get together and head for the state line. But why did everybody else join them? Because, see, the problem you've got here now is that if the convoy gets stopped, you're all busted. Whereas, if you had all gone off in different directions, the worst case scenario is one of you might get caught and busted. It's not like they took IDs before the fight. They can't prove which truck drivers were and weren't at the fight for the most part. Now, the sheriff knows the three mains, and at least knows Rubber Duck and Spider Mike. And even in that case, those three, it makes sense for them to split up. Pigpin, Spider Mike, and Rubber Duck. Because the sheriff's only going to be able to catch one of them. So again, the worst case scenario is one of you gets busted, all of the others get away. By sticking together, you're greatly increasing the odds of everybody getting caught. So, 
getting a dozen con a dozen eighteen wheelers and a convoy going down the road looks really pretty, but it's incredibly stupid. Kind of like Brotherhood of the Wolf. When the sheriff finally catches up to the convoy in the only remaining police car, the only car able to navigate the tiny dirt road that all the 18-wheelers had no problem with, the two rear truckers decide to take him out by squishing him between the 18-wheelers. I don't know about you, but this seems like several magnitudes more illegal than the fight, fist fight that had broken out at the diner, right? Because this is flat-out attempted murder. That was heat of the moment assault. This is flat out trying to kill a police officer. Also, I'd be really paranoid by rubbing my 18-wheeler up against another car that's rubbed up against another 18-wheeler that I would do damage to my tires. Because you blow out your tires and you're not getting away. And now you're going to be arrested for, what was it, vagrancy, assault, attempted murder, evading arrest. Man, you ain't gonna have a good day. Finally, our convoy makes it to New Mexico, so the movie's over, right? I mean, they escaped the evil cop, they crossed the state line. Now would be a perfect time for everybody to split up, go their own ways, and pretend this whole thing never happened, and then maybe spend the rest of your life trucking along the East Coast. Yeah? Only we've got an hour left of this, so I'm sure that's not what's gonna happen. After listening to their adventures over the CB, a bunch of other truckers and a bus full of hippies decide to join up with the convoy. Why? Why would a group of ordinary people going about their day suddenly join a group of people running from the law? Congratulations. You just made yourself an accessory to attempted murder and a whole bunch of other stuff. For no reason other than Rubber Duck sounds like a cool guy. You know, I don't remember anybody joining up along the white Bronco during the car chase, is what I'm saying. As OJ's going down the road, nobody else thought, dude, that's super cool, and got in line with him. Without consulting each other, the entire convoy decides to run through a federal weighing station without stopping. Okay, now you're going to have New Mexico police after you, so what's the plan? A new state line? Not only that, that's a federal weighing station. You all just broke federal laws, so there's no state line you can pass. And why'd you do it? More than half of you weren't breaking any laws until you did that. And now you're all on the lam. What's the plan here? When are you going to stop? Where are you going to get away from this? More and more truck drivers join the convoy, and even the rubber duck has no idea why. I seriously can't wrap my head around this. Why are perfectly good, law-abiding people suddenly joining a gang on the run from the law? Also, the more trucks that join you, the easier you are to spot, and you have a whole new state full of police officers after you. What is your plan? Since they ran the weighing station, there is now a federal agent in a helicopter that's following them. Congratulations, guys. Since you all decided to run that station for no reason whatsoever, there's now no state line to help you. And I'm not sure why you ran the station. There was nobody in active pursuit of you at the time. Everybody else was out of the race. Rubber Duck explains to the sheriff that he's hauling high explosives and has no intention of stopping for the barricade. This announcement quickly disbands the entire barricade that's been erected. Wow! That was easy. So, you guys didn't want to lay down some spike strips or leave some empty vehicles or anything? Basically, you've surrendered. This convoy is now the president of America. I mean, there's nothing we can do about it, right? They're now calling the shots. You didn't even want to try and figure out a way to maybe stop them. Good choice. While the police clear the path for the convoy and a neighborhood marching band plays to celebrate their arrival in town, I want to ask this movie another question. What happens if one of those trucks runs out of gas? Because we're going from state to state. None of the trucks who joined in the convoy were planning to join in a convoy. Therefore, there's no reason to assume they all have full gas tanks to start with. Do, there's a police helicopter following them, so is it just, okay, one of them's peeling off for gas, grab him. Oh, look, somebody else needs gas, somebody grab him. Never addressed, never comes up. 
Gasoline is not a factor in this movie. The governor of New Mexico sends a representative to find out if the convoy is some kind of political movement, and if so, what their agenda is. After interviewing several of the truckers, we find out that they do have a list of grievances, corrupt cops, racism, and most of them are upset about the new 55 mile per hour nationwide speed limit set because of the gas shortage. This is an actual thing, you can, you can Google it. So, what originally was trying to get away from the cops has now become some kind of political movement. Occupy Highway. It turns out the governor has actually been told to call out the National Guard to just blow up the convoy. Which seems like it would be kind of a big overreaction to a bunch of 18-wheelers who, apart from attempting to murder one cop, haven't really done anything yet. Although, they did threaten to cause an explosion, so I guess they are terrorists now. Uh, but it's an election year, and this convoy has captured the public's imagination. So, he sets aside a field to meet with the drivers and discuss their grievances, and cops have been ordered to stay away from them. Spider Mike can't attend because he just got word that his wife's in the hospital about to give birth, so he peels off and heads to Texas to attend the birth of his child. This ends poorly for him. So poorly, in fact, that when the evil sheriff finally catches up to him, he actually feels bad about the beating the other cops had given him. They decide to keep him in prison anyway, though, to lure out the rubber duck. After making love to White Halle Berry, the rubber duck goes to meet with the governor. The rubber duck gets a message that Mike's in trouble. This message was conveyed from truck to truck, from Texas to New Mexico. The story was carried, so of course it also shows a nice game of telephone where he was beat pretty bad, they caved in his skull, they broke his legs, he kept getting worse and worse. The governor is willing to make all sorts of empty promises and gestures, but he's not willing to actually do anything to help Spider Mike. So the rubber duck tells his gang, I'm going to go get Spider Mike. You guys deal with this governor and get us whatever it is you want, because I'm not actually in this for the political stuff. I just didn't want to get arrested. And he leaves. Of course, while the rubber duck is in Texas trying to figure out a plan, the rest of the convoy arrives to help. What happened with the meeting with the governor? It's a good question. It's never addressed. Uh, here we are now, and this is where the sheriff's plan falls apart. Good job. Your plan was to lure the truckers to you, and they did. Now you have an army of 18-wheel trucks, and you have nothing to stop them with. No backup apart from the tiny local sh cop department, all of whom abandon you at the first sight of all of these angry truckers. Gee, who could have imagined that pissing off truckers would piss off truckers? A couple of the trucks start chasing down the cops who ran away and end up destroying this small Texas town. Seriously, do these guys think there's no such thing as laws anymore? They came into town to get Spider Mike, right? Upon seeing them, all the other cops except for the evil sheriff went, Oh God! and left. And then trucks peeled off and chased after them. And in the chase, destroyed many, 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 many buildings. Why? They left already. You're just causing mayhem for no reason. You can't tell me there's no people inside any of these buildings. You have now committed terrorist acts. I'm going to assume murder. You have destroyed a small Texas town. Okay? This started out as running for the cops and you have now destroyed a town. So, even though it's just the sheriff they're up against now, how are they going to get Mike out? He's got a whole bunch of guns in there. The weight of the law is on his side. What are they going to do? At some point, they're going to have to get out of their trucks and go in there. And at that point, the sheriff, by the way, has every legal right to just gun them down in the street at this point. They are destroying the city. They are terrorists. Seriously. I just... We have completely left any realm of reality at this point, all right? The members of the convoy are now domestic terrorists. That's what they are. They've destroyed a town. They've destroyed a police station. At this point, calling the National Guard in to blow them up is no longer an overreaction. It is now a measured and valid response. But at least we get this nice confrontation between the sheriff and the rubber duck. Yeah, nothing but a two-bit, lion cheating, law-breaking trucker. What the hell are you? Take a look at yourself. You're just a broke down old, bribe-taking piece of meanness.
You tell me, old man. What good are you? I am the Lord. I am the Lord! Don't you understand? I represent the law. Law! Well, piss on you. And piss on your law. Okay, Mr. Sheriff, Rubber Duck, now controls an army. He has proven himself to be untouchable by law enforcement and capable of destroying entire towns. There's nothing too bit about him. Mr. Duck? That piss on the law attitude of yours is going to end up getting you shot, and it certainly removes any possibility of you being a sympathetic character. Now you two hug it out. So Rubber Duck decides that the entire convoy is going to head for Mexico. Yeah, your chances in this country are pretty much over. Luckily, I'm sure the Mexican government is going to open their arms wide to the band of terrorists that are now trying to cross their borders. Sadly, an unluckily placed school bus ends up separating the entire convoy from Rubber Duck. Hilariously, by slamming on his brakes to avoid hitting children, Pigpin has gotten the entire convoy stopped by the police. And just like that, the tale of the convoy menace that thumbed their noses at authority, destroyed towns, attempted to murder police officers, came to an end. At no point do any of the characters even talk about the loads that they're hauling, right? The goods they're hauling have to get somewhere. Their jobs depend on it. By randomly joining up with this convoy and then becoming domestic terrorists, they've pretty much given up their job with no way to get it back. Because when those goods aren't delivered, and by the way, we end up talking like a hundred trucks. So there's going to be an economic thing felt from this. Right? Economic ripples from all of these undelivered goods. These people are all going to lose their jobs. They're not going to be able to work as truckers anymore. And I'm going to guess most of them didn't get jobs as truckers because it was fun, but because it was what they had to do. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure trucking can be fun, and I'm sure there are people that pick it for that lifestyle. But I'm going to assume that a good majority of these truckers who have now thrown away their livelihood aren't going to be able to then go land office jobs running the copier and, and working in Microsoft Word. But we don't ever hear about any of that. We don't hear any of the real world effects of A, them neglecting their jobs, B, them refusing to recognize the law. All we get left now is find out what happens to the rubber duck, who is now all by himself without a convoy to back him up. Turns out that the National Guard is waiting for him at the border. But Rubber Duck can't back down now, so he decides to play chicken with the army. I'd just like to take us back to how this all began. A black man was provoked by a cop and threw a punch at him. A punch that was well-deserved considering everything that had led up to it. Because of that, an army of uh, who was formed of domestic terrorists who threatened to blow people up, attempted to kill a cop, destroyed a town. Hundreds of people are now in jail. And a man who did not throw the first punch, who did not even throw the second or third punch in that fight, is now barreling down on an army about to blow him up. Because one man threw a incredibly provoked punch. That escalated quickly. Driving an 18-wheeler full of dangerous explosives towards an army on a small bridge ends exactly as well as you think it would. And thus ends the tale of the rubber duck. He died for no discernible reason. I mean, seriously. I'm not 100% sure why he got involved in this in the first place, let alone was the leader. And by the way, throughout the entire movie, he agrees with me. He has no idea why he's the leader, and he has no idea why there are this many people in the convoy. The main character doesn't know. I don't know. Do the writers know? Apparently... The governor of New Mexico chose to pardon all the truckers because the entire convoy is reunited at the Rubber Ducks funeral in New Mexico, even though they were all arrested in Texas after destroying a town. I, I, 
the destroyed town of Texas. There were no consequences. They all violated federal law by going through that way station after, you know, running from the cops in an assault charge in another state. No consequences. They almost committed first-degree murder several times against the sheriff. No consequences. The only person in this movie who suffered any consequences was the rubber duck. We will guarantee that the rubber duck's voice will be heard. Quack, quack. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Martin Penwold. Seriously? Dude was in an 18-wheeler that was being shot at by a tank that then exploded, that then went over a bridge, and all he gets out of it is a missing eye. Seriously. This entire movie is the story of a situation spiraling radically out of control for no discernible reasons and then nobody having any consequences from it. What the hell was the point of this movie? Nothing happens to any of these characters. Nothing changes. They start out in trouble with the law and at the end they're not in trouble with the law but we don't know why because they didn't change their attitude. They didn't change their behavior. Just everything magically worked out. I don't understand I don't understand why people randomly joined this convoy, right? Random law-abiding citizens went, Hey, look, there's a group of criminals. That sounds like fun. Hundreds of them. And again, nothing happened to them. I don't know what the ultimate plan of the convoy was. Where were they going? Where were they hoping to get away from the law? Originally, it was cross a state line. And then we're free from the sheriff. Okay, maybe. Although I'm pretty sure there's a hot pursuit thing that might be a problem there. But maybe that's reasonable. Except as soon as you crossed the state line, the first thing you did was break federal law. So what was your plan then? More state lines? Federal covers the country, buddy. So now that we've broken federal law for no reason, we got to go to another country. I'm sure there won't be any problems crossing an army across a country border. I don't understand what their plan was. I don't understand why Rubber Duck was in charge of this group. He doesn't either. He points out several times in the movie, I got no clue why they're following me. I don't understand how Rubber Duck survived. I don't understand why he was the only person to have his life in peril, but I don't understand how he survived either, or what the point of him surviving was. Nobody suffered any consequences for the heinous actions taken in this movie. Do you know the only person to suffer consequences in this movie? The only person to which bad things happened? Me, because I had to watch it! Hi, I'm Luke Bryan, two-time CMA Entertainer of the Year. If I ever learn how to read, I'm going to read The Great Platypus Caper by Jeff Hillary, because I believe in supporting fine literature. I'm Luke Bryan. Hi. So, Robert, this is hard to do. Rubber duck. <laughs> the problem is shifting in and out of rubber duck, and making a sentence work is not easy. It looks really cool, but it's incredibly easy. Wow, Brotherhood of the Wolf has taken a beating two reviews in a row. I'd almost feel bad if I hadn't had to sit through and watch the whole thing. That was passionate. Good job.